Okay, what are the side effects we're seeing with the COVID vaccines? Well, the good news is the side effects we're seeing are generally the same that you're going to get uh, as the side effects you'll see with any other vaccine. So hopefully most of you have taken flu shots or getting your tetanus boosters. Uh, and the common side effects we see are this sore arm, really. Uh, but the vast majority of the people we're, we're seeing with sore arms, and it's high, it's 70 to 80% of people, uh, it's not so sore that you need to take medications. Um, we know also more than 10% of people will feel headaches or muscles or joint pain or fever or chills. Uh, we know that some people have the swelling or tenderness under the the armpit, which probably has to do with lymph nodes uh, responding to the vaccine. Um, we know that uh, one to 10% of people have redness and swelling at the site of their injection, which will be your shoulder. Some will get nausea and vomiting, and then less commonly, we'll see uh, people with enlarged lymph nodes. Um, these numbers tend to be a little bit higher than what we'll see with standard influenza vaccine, but the good news is uh, these symptoms generally resolve in a couple of days, right, and, uh, and tend to be quite mild. Serious allergic reactions uh, tend to be quite rare with these vaccines, and we think that's probably in the order of a, one in a few hundred thousand. All right. Um, now, do we really know about the side effects of the vaccine? Uh, people will say, look, we haven't had these vaccines for a long time. So I just want to remind people that as of a couple of days ago, there's been 726 million doses of COVID vaccines that have been distributed, so that have actually been provided worldwide, not just distributed, but they've gone into arms. Um, I mean, that's phenomenal, right? So, and and I don't know if there's ever been a medical intervention that has had the type of scrutiny that, uh, that these vaccines have had. So there's been very, very careful monitoring. Uh, again, you know, with, uh, with side effects, there's a, there's a monitoring system where all this data is, is coalesced. Um, so it is, you know, every day that goes by, it's uh, where we don't hear a signal of very severe side effects. Um, you know, it is encouraging. That leads us perhaps to really, uh, you know, one of the big questions we're hearing is what is going on with AstraZeneca, in particular, what's going on with AstraZeneca and blood clots. Uh, fortunately, there's a very good study that came out of the U.S. that I referred to previously that, that showed effectiveness. Uh, then, you know, that original study didn't have a, a lot of people who were over uh, 65, so countries backed off, including Canada initially. Uh, we were all reassured by the real world data in the UK and the United Kingdom has, has gone very heavy on AstraZeneca. And it's important to recognize that what I, when I showed you that drop in, in cases in uh, the UK, um, you know, whatever vaccine effect has caused that is predominantly because of AstraZeneca. Um, so so it's, the rollout has been really complicated. Um, What's going on with AstraZeneca and blood clots? Okay, so you've all heard this story. The first came out of um, out of Europe. Um, you know, important one to recognize. This is exactly what should happen when we start seeing these cases. Uh, when there's a trend that's identified, or even the possibility of cases being linked to vaccine, that needs to be identified, as circulated, and people need to know about this, and we need to investigate further. Um, so there's been about 70 cases of quite severe blood clots. Uh, it tends to be, those cases tend to be in people under 55, and certainly there's been more, more women who've been affected than men. Uh, in Canada, uh, there's a body called the National, National Advisory Council on Immunizations. Uh, you often hear to it referred to as NACI. And um, they've recommended at this point until more data is available, that uh, we're not using AstraZeneca in people under 55 years of age. Now, just to contextualize this, right, uh, the, the rates of these severe clots are anywhere between one in 100,000, I, I think, uh, at, at the most, and probably somewhere between one in 500,000 to a million. Um, this is much lower than the rates of clots you're going to get if you catch COVID. Right, so we know that um, a fair percentage, probably somewhere around two percent of people with COVID, are going to get quite severe illness, uh, and we know a lot of those people with severe illness, it's because of, of clots you have. So listen, um, I think there's the story is not closed on AstraZeneca and these clots. I, I think uh, you know many of us are trying to listen very closely to how. Uh, the, how this data is being interpreted, uh, and there is more to come. Do I feel comfortable with AstraZeneca and people over 55 years of age? I feel quite reassured by the, the data that came out of the US. Uh, I feel quite reassured by the monitoring that's going on in terms of these clots. Um, 
So, you know, that's where we're at. If you're over 55 years of age, you can get access to AstraZeneca. It is available in pharmacies. Um, it is being rolled out in primary care. Um, uh, you know, to me, it's, it's certainly better to get AstraZeneca than to not get a vaccine and wait three or four months, perhaps for another vaccine. Um, but again, uh, more to come in this story. Okay, are, people, are vaccines safe for people with certain medical conditions? So let's talk about that. Um, there was a lot of discussion uh, around people who are immunocompromised or people with autoimmune disorders. Uh, the reason that's come up is primarily because uh, most of the studies didn't include people who were immunocompromised or had autoimmune disorders. The main concern in, if you have one of these conditions is not that the vaccine will cause harm, but if you're on, for example, uh, a medication that suppresses your immune system, the concern is that the vaccine won't be as effective, that you won't be able to produce as robust an immune response. So um, the advice we're giving to people who are on medications that will suppress your immune system or, uh, you know, perhaps have a health condition that, uh, where your immune system is suppressed, uh, talk to your healthcare provider to ensure that you work out the best timing for the dose, right? So if, for example, uh, you're taking uh, a medication once every three or four weeks, it might make most sense to try to get the vaccine uh, right before your dose. Um, but these are conditions that really depend on the particular condition, particular medication. But important to recognize, it's not that the vaccine will be dangerous in those conditions. It just might not be as effective. Um, what, if, what if you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding? This is always an issue with any medical intervention, um, you know, the studies will not bring in pregnant women uh, to inject them with the vaccine or give them a medication and see what happens, right? For obvious reasons. So often we struggle with trying to make um, recommendations for people who are trying to get pregnant, who are pregnant, or who are breastfeeding. Here's the good news. Most major bodies, including the group that oversees obstetricians and gynecologists in Canada, the World Health Organization, has clearly stated that you should be able to get a COVID vaccine when you're pregnant. And important to recognize that if you're pregnant, you're at higher risk of getting severe COVID. So when you're balancing risks and benefits, I think most of us feel quite strongly that pregnant women, women who are breastfeeding should be able to get the vaccine. There's some literature out there suggesting that that might even provide protection to, to newborns, uh, particularly if you're breastfeeding. Um, I think most of us feel this isn't a risk. What does the data show us? Well, look, there, in, in the trials that I referred to before, uh, they did not include pregnant women, but there were pregnant women who got pregnant. Life happens, right? Uh, they got pregnant in those trials. The good news is, and it's a very small number, but we didn't see an increase in miscarriages or any birth uh, deformities. So there's no signal of that. There are uh, large databases. There's one in the US of 30,000 women. So far, there's nothing we have heard uh, that suggests that rates of miscarriages or birth defects are any higher uh, than in the general population. So when we look at the physiology of these viruses and we look at the information that's out there, I think most of us feel very strongly that pregnant women should get vaccinated. I can just tell you anecdotally that I have many colleagues who are either trying to get pregnant or are pregnant uh, when their turn has come up, they have all got healthcare workers, they've all gotten the vaccine. Um, there is something circulating on the internet about uh, the vaccine preventing fertility. It's based on a real um, scientific uh, inaccuracy, right? Uh, saying that there's, there's a, a part of the spike virus that is similar to what's on, uh, on human placenta, I believe, but really it doesn't make any sense. At this point, if uh, people are planning to get pregnant, there should be absolutely no problem getting the vaccine, all right? Um, and again, uh, data is accumulating that, that uh, uh, is, is quite reassuring. What if I've had COVID already? Is that a problem? Um, should I get the vaccine? Absolutely, right? So we don't know how long immunity lasts with the vaccine. When we look at antibody levels in the laboratory, we know it can wane anywhere three to five months after you've had um, the, the infection. So absolutely, even if you've had the COVID vaccine, uh, sorry, COVID illness, you should get the vaccine. I have a guy who was sick three or four weeks ago. Uh, he's in line to get the COVID vaccine next week. So um, uh, it's not a problem. Many, you might hear your, your healthcare worker telling you to wait a month or so until you get the vaccine. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the only advantage to that is that we're noticing for people who've had 
the the infection. Uh, one, they're they're generally protected for the next month. Uh, but if we give the vaccine, sometimes their side effects are more prominent. Their immune system is is primed already. Um, so that would be really the only reason to wait. Uh, you should not go in and get the COVID vaccine if you're still sick from COVID, right? Or if you have symptoms of COVID. And of, of course, that uh, that's I'm sure obvious to, to most of you. Uh, 